Coming up on Valley View News, a free pop-up learning center keeps children focused during school, plus how COVID-19 is affecting Halloween, and Chicano identity shared through the murals of East LA. Hello and welcome to Valley View News. I'm Amanda Alvarado. And I'm Ryan Ketchum in the Digital Media Center. President Trump didn't pay taxes for 10 years over a 15-year period, according to a New York Times report. Also, it shows he only paid $750 in federal income taxes the year he ran for president and his first year in office. Trump denies the allegations. Uh, totally fake news. No, actually, I paid tax. But, and you'll see that as soon as my tax returns. Uh, it, it's under audit. They've been under audit for a long time. The IRS does not treat me well. The president apparently found multiple ways to reduce his tax bills. He reported heavy losses on his businesses. One reduction is from his appearance on the show The Apprentice. He claimed a $70,000 tax deduction for his hairstyling. Also, the president's daughter, Ivanka, helped reduce the family's tax burden by being paid more than $700,000 in consulting fees. President Trump nominated Amy Coney Barrett as the new Supreme Court Justice. Trump says it's a very proud moment. Barrett secedes the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Barrett said she will serve the people. I clerked for Justice Scalia more than 20 years ago, but the lessons I learned still resonate. His judicial philosophy is mine too. The nomination has opposition, however. Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer said that a vote for Barrett is a vote to strike down the Affordable Care Act. Democrats also oppose Barrett's stances on gun rights, immigration, and abortion. The timing of the nomination was criticized since it comes less than two months before the presidential election. President Trump and Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden won't shake hands at the first presidential debate tomorrow night. COVID-19 has changed the way candidates will greet each other. Trump says he's excited. I am, I do. I look, I'm really, I am looking, I am looking very forward to the debate. Thank you, everybody. The estimated 60 to 70 audience members will get tested for COVID-19 before it starts. Chris Wallace of Fox News moderates the 90-minute debate. It will focus on six topics. A ballistics report in Breonna Taylor's case contradicts claims made by police about what happened in the March 13th shooting. The Kentucky State Police say the bullet that hit Louisville Sergeant Jonathan Mattingly could not be confirmed to have come from Taylor's boyfriend's gun. State Attorney General Daniel Cameron said the officers only carried 40 caliber guns. However, the report reveals that another officer involved, Brett Hankinson, was issued a 9mm gun. Hankinson was indicted on three counts of first-degree wanton endangerment. No one has been charged for the death of Taylor. This school year brings many new challenges to students because of COVID-19. Some groups are helping students adapt to virtual learning. Karina Gutierrez reports on a church in Chatsworth that's doing its part to help students in the community. A pop-up learning center at Freedom Church is now open. Kids from kindergarten up to eighth grade are welcome. The learning center helps parents who are struggling with work and virtual learning, says campus director Vanessa Rodriguez. We knew that during this time right now, uh, financially parents are, and families are hurting, um, and we wanted just to provide a resource that was absolutely free with no strings attached. The church works with LAUSD's Grab and Go to provide meals for the kids throughout the day. A maximum of 40 students are accepted. A background check is required for each volunteer. Learning Center lead Rosa Milian says the program follows CDC guidelines. They disinfect and wear masks. So the way we are practicing social distancing is by having the tables apart, by six feet apart, and having one student per table. The Learning Center does not offer a personal one-on-one -on -one assistance, but they do help students with any help needed. Volunteer Cindy Brandall has a daughter attending the Learning Center. She says this is an answer to her prayer because both her daughters can now concentrate. When we found out about this place, I was able to bring them and they could stay separated. The little one who really needed to be active all the time is getting that.
The Learning Center will continue until schools reopen. Reporting from Chatsworth, I'm Karina Gutierrez for Valley View News. There's a record number of wildfires taking place in California. More than 3.7 million acres have been burned so far. In Northern California, the Glass Fire burned 11,000 acres. It's 0% contained. The Bobcat Fire in Southern California burned 176 square miles. It's at 65% containment. These are only two of the 75 fires on the West Coast. Meanwhile, red flag warnings remain in effect for the Bobcat Fire. Officials fear it may spread. Coronavirus cases are declining in Orange County, but OC will stay in the red tier for three weeks before it moves to the less restrictive orange tier. Officials think trends are pointing to easing rules. Supervisor Lisa Barlett says the trend is encouraging, but more analysis is needed. Orange County had 165 new coronavirus cases and 10 additional deaths. Meanwhile, their number of intensive care cases dropped from 50 to 47 cases. Students who attended in-person classes at Cal State University Long Beach must now quarantine after five students tested positive for COVID-19. Four of those students stayed in the university dorms. In-person classes have been canceled for the next two weeks. All students living on campus will also be tested for the virus. The quarantine affects more than 3,000 students who attended in-person classes this fall. Yom Kippur started Monday at sundown. The holiday was celebrated outdoors and online because of COVID-19. The LA County's Public Health Service prohibits indoor religious services due to COVID-19. Members of LA's Jewish community stood out at the corners of the synagogues last Sunday as a symbol of hope and renewal. President Donald Trump says Yom Kippur serves as a reminder of the faith Americans have kept the past few months because of the challenges from COVID-19. As the spooky season approaches, the LA County Department of Public Health released a list of recommendations on how to stay safe during Halloween. Valley View News reporter Nikiko Burnett spoke to a Halloween store owner who managed to get his loyal customers involved with helping his sick child. The coronavirus pandemic won't stop people from celebrating Halloween. Ryan Goldman, owner of Phantom Halloween Store, says after seven months, he's starting to see a COVID fatigue set in. We're now September turning in October. People are kind of wanting to do what they want to do at this point. Mary Jane and her little sister Alexandra want to dress up for Halloween. They're not happy with how COVID is affecting their plans. They say it's canceled, but then I still want to go outside. So I'm going to ask. Like, yeah, it's kind of like boring. It's like you can't do nothing. Phantom Halloween stores have been in Goldman's family for generations. They're open year round. The store gives back to those who have helped his family. I have a disabled son and children's hospital uh, as far as I'm concerned, saved his life. In the past three years, his stores have raised more than $50,000 for Children's Hospital Los Angeles. It's, it's our give back charity. It, it makes us feel good about what we're doing, trying to make this world a better place. Goldman says his next goal is to donate $100,000 in 2021. Reporting from West Hills, I'm Nikiko Burnett for Valley View News. More to come on Valley View News. We show how the Chicano movement showcased its identity through murals in East Los Angeles. I want to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I need to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Why can't I eat, eat, eat apples and bananas? Support the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks to help provide meals to those in need. Join us at feedingamerica.org. Eva Marie smoked 12,000 packs of cigarettes over 15 years. She quit, and now there's a new lung cancer screening that could save her life. You stopped smoking. Now start screening. No matter how much you smoked, early detection could save you. Talk to your doctor or learn more at savedbythescan.org. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Chicano Moratoria. The moratorium marked an important shift in an activism for Mexican Americans in Los Angeles. 
Part of that activism included the making of murals, which helped create a sense of identity. In this 10-minute documentary, Eric Montaño explains the significance of East LA mural art and its direct connection to Mexico. Olympic Boulevard, Union Pacific Avenue, and the infamous Whittier Boulevard. These are but a few of the streets that make up the vibrant city of East Los Angeles. East LA is an unincorporated neighborhood within the East Side District of Los Angeles County. East LA is known as the nation's largest Mexican-American barrio, with 96% of the population identifying as Latino, according to the 2018 U.S. Census. During the 1920s, the city became a major destination for Mexican immigrants and Mexican immigrants from other areas of the Southwest due to commonalities found throughout the city. The 60s and 70s brought social change and gave birth to the Chicano movement after the catalyzing death of Los Angeles Times reporter Ruben Salazar in 1970. The movimiento aimed to foster ethnic pride, highlighting injustices and discrimination while breeding new political consciousness. The moratorium marked an important shift towards self-representation and helped create an alternative sphere of cultural production and identity through muralism as a form of symbolic interaction. To better understand the mural movement that took place in East LA, we must go back to where it all began, Mexico. The 1910 Mexico Revolution that aimed to overthrow the dictator Porfirio Diaz awoke the spirit of Mexico. Artists living in Mexico were caught in the midst of the Mexican Revolution that took place until 1921. Under the new directive of the Minister of Education, a series of commissioned public art was established with the purpose of creating a new cultural and national Mexican identity, marrying the modern with the old and drawing upon the rich Mexican history and heritage. Among the artists enlisted was Diego Rivera, and thus the beginning of Mexico's mural movement began. En esta casa, Museo Casa Diego Rivera fue donde eh, pues nació Diego. Él vivió aquí nada más hasta los seis años de edad. En 1921 llegó a México, eh, dice un compañero que transformado o hecho un monstruo, ¿no? O sea, no físicamente, sino este, pues como artista. Todo regresó siendo pues, ya Diego Rivera. Él empezó con los murales a raíz de que le encargaron un mural para eh, un colegio que se llama San Ildefonso. Ese colegio, lo que él eh, pretendía plasmar en los murales era enseñar, porque la gente en aquel entonces, pues la mayoría éramos como analfabetas, o sea, no sabíamos ni, no, no sabíamos escribir ni leer ni nada de eso. Entonces, Diego lo que plasmaba en los murales era siempre tratar de educar a la gente o decirle a la gente cómo estaba la sociedad. Y por ejemplo, a mí personalmente con este mural de Sueño de una tarde dominicana en la Mera Central, eh, me ha puesto a investigar lo que es, por ejemplo, lo que pasó en la conquista, ¿no? Y los personajes que estuvieron en la conquista, en el porfiriato, qué pasó en el porfiriato, qué pasó durante el, el gobierno de Francisco y Madero, por ejemplo, ¿no? Yo, pues, eh, no me había dado cuenta de eso hasta que pues, vi el mural y dije, bueno, sí tiene un montón de personajes que ni siquiera conozco. Entonces, de esa forma siento que Diego hasta la fecha nos ha estado como enseñando, ¿no? Y este pues era como su principal objetivo, ¿no? Él plasma mucho lo que era eh, México, porque, eh, pues no sé si es como su objetivo, ¿no? a lo mejor creía que, no sé, México debía ser conocido por todo el mundo, ¿no? ¿Qué son murales? Son paintings, están contando una historia, for the whole public to see, you know. They're done in a large scale, whether indoor or outdoor. I actually started with Aleda Guadalupe. And the way I got into it, Sam Cepeda, who is a psychologist, had a program during the summer to keep the, uh, the youth involved. 
painting the buildings and the uh, Maravilla projects. So they wanted to do, a, the, the guys there, the Arizona gang, wanted to do a mural. They asked him, what do you want? He says, well, we want the Guadalupe. <laughs> it was their, their saint, their culture. The icon of Our Lady actually goes back before, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years before the Spaniards. She actually had a different name, and she was also idled by the indigenous people of Mexico. About a year before 1971, my brother was killed. Just around here, you know, not too far away. It was really hard for me to to relate to any, say anybody affiliated with, with gangs. The, kid, the kids wanted uh, to do the Vita Guadalupe, and that got me out of it. I felt that these kids are just like everybody else. They're scared, they're together because they're protecting themselves. They're just regular kids. They're not all mean, they're not all bad. They're just involved with it in the little culture that they have, that they, that's all they know. To them it's identity. Chicano identity is being aware of our culture, our history. Identity is what we see around us. My mural, it, it brought in the community together. It really did. I mean, people build, I mean, they made murals or later Guadalupe out everywhere, but for some reason, the timing and the community, one thing, it was it was something different, it's something special. The murals are a good way of communication to the mass public on the outside. Growing up in East L.A. on the big mediums and television and Hollywood has always been the denizen of bad guys, gang violence, drug deal, poverty. That's the image that's perpetuated or has been perpetuated throughout the years. This thing's painted at the ground zero of violence from the authorities to the people of East LA. This is ground zero to the moratorium. The moratorium, which was in 1970, really was the fuse that blew everything up. Instead of painting the big bad wolf, his back tires is a couple of calaveras. They're not important. We're important. The victim of the violence of the moratorium is larger than the perpetrators of the violence. And central of a, of course, here is a family group. See, we got an image of Ruben Salazar. But one thing I always read was Ruben Salazar in the editorial. The group that occupy the left, Los Tigres del Norte, are the folk singers. Sing everything about contrabando and la migra and just topics that you're not going to see on uh, Channel 2 news. You're not going to read it in the Time magazine. It, it relates to Los de Abajo. No pretendo ser tu dueño. Tell you a little secret. I titled that mural. <laughs> this is a mural David was painting or had painted when we first met or when we second met in 75. He says, I'm thinking for a title. And I saw that scroll with a, a contract. It says contract and it says, man, you got to read between the lines before you sign anything. The Latin lover stereotype. And there's mom working in the kitchen. There's a lot of stereotypes in here. Uh, campesino all tangled up. And he's got the guys in their lab coats back there observing them through with bulletproof glass. This young boy is being raised in all this turmoil and culture clashes. Instead of sitting there and being confused, we have an indigenous deity coming down in the form of Quetzalcoatl to inspire him to the truth. My name is Fabian Debora, and I am born in El Paso, Texas, uh, but raised in Boyle Heights in East LA. I was an East Los streetscaper at the age of 17, and probably one of the youngest at the time. This is designed for battered women with children. The drive behind this, the first thing that came to me was el poder de la mujer, the power of the woman. This is my sister, Wendy, with my little nephew, Noah. 
I asked my sister, I said, hey, can I do a portrait of you? I want to use it for a mural, but you're going to be the queen of angels. So this is a Chicana, but this is more of the symbolism of a mother and child. With the hieroglyphics of the rays of a queen, it looks like if it's gang writing almost, like a little hint of, of, of street life. You see the city of LA here, it's smaller in proportion to her, so as if she's rising from the city of LA, La Reina de Los Angeles. Here you have a father without a head, a headless father, which represents that the kid is growing up without a father. There's two destinations for that kid. It's either the street life or the nurturing for mother, but he chooses to become nurtured by the mother, which then builds stability which represents the Sixth Street Bridge, which is firm stability, which then allows for the new generations to exist. And here you have the kids playing a game of race. Ready, set, go! And they're running off to East Los Angeles. Like the mural movement of Mexico, the Chicano murals and movement of the U.S. represented and depicted their own imagined mestizo community, embedded in a vital mix of identity and culture. Like Rivera said, the community murals created by Chicanos were not only art for the people, but rather art of the people, creating their own sense of identity. When we come back, the Dream Center gives free food to communities throughout Los Angeles, also, a family side business thrives despite COVID-19. Stay with us. You think getting dumped by text is harsh? Try getting dumped by tennis ball. My ex-owner drove me out to the woods, yelled fetch, and by the time I bought the ball back, he was gone. Yeah, I was pissed. <laughs> but the folks at the shelter helped me let go of my anger. I learned coping skills, like taking it to the hole. Boom! Now I'm ready to fetch again. But how about I throw and you run and get it? A federal judge blocked President Trump's ban on TikTok. The popular video sharing app said the president's ban violates free speech and due process rights. If the courts would have sided with the administration, the app would have not been available for downloads to smartphones in the U.S. Any updates would have also been denied. The White House claims China can use the app to gather data on Americans and could possibly blackmail people. The White House said it will continue its fight to ban the app. United Airlines pilots approved a plan to prevent nearly 3,000 furloughs. The furloughs were to start October 1st when $25 billion in federal aid expires. The airline made an agreement with the pilots' union to reduce work hours instead of having furloughs. United said it will still cut 13,000 other jobs in October. Some employees at other airlines are accepting leaves of absence or buyouts in order to reduce staff. The Dream Center provides resources to communities throughout Los Angeles. Reporter Brittany Smith explains the Dream Center's mission of giving out free meals. We're all over LA. You know, honestly, we have Glendale, we have some in Long Beach. The Dream Center hands out over 11,000 meals a day to the people of LA. We have some in Southgate. Tatiana Galvez works with the Dream Center. She delivers meals to the homes of the elderly in the community. With the help of L.A. Dodgers player Justin Turner and other generous donors, the Dream Center, a religious-based nonprofit organization, set up a food drive to provide free meals for L.A. during this time of crisis. We have families that live here, you know, homeless families, single mothers. They come in here and they eat and they feed on a regular basis, not just right now. They feed over 2,000 people. For some elderly who can't leave their homes, the Dream Center's delivery is a big help. It's also free of charge. If you need a meal delivered to you or an elderly person you know of, you can apply online at thedreamcenter.org for a delivery. Bye, Miss Gloria. Here in LA, North Hollywood, we're providing hot meals to them every day. The Dream Center is open Monday through Friday, and they're here to serve anyone who's in need of a hot meal. In downtown LA, I'm Brittany Smith reporting. Hall of Fame quarterback Joe Montana saved his grandchild from a kidnapper. It happened at his Malibu home Saturday. 
The LA County Sheriff's Department says the suspect, Sozai Dalzell, removed the nine-month-old child from a living room playpen. The former 49er quarterback and his wife confronted the woman and took the child from Dalzell's arms. She then fled the scene. Dalzell was later arrested at a nearby house. She's charged with kidnapping and burglary. The NFL made history after two female coaches and a female referee worked the regular season football game. The Washington football team's full-year coaching intern, Jennifer King, and the Cleveland Browns' chief of staff, Callie Brownson, were on the sidelines for their teams. Sarah Thomas, the league's first female referee, officiated the game. Jennifer King is also the NFL's first black female full-time assistant coach. The Browns defeated Washington 34-20. The Lakers are back in the NBA Finals. L.A. defeated the Denver Nuggets in five games Saturday night. The Lakers will make their 32nd appearance in the finals. That's the most by any team. LeBron James is making his 10th finals appearance, tied for third all-time by a player. And the Lakers are second in finals victories, one behind their historic rival, the Boston Celtics. The last time the Lakers made it to the finals was in 2010, capturing their second straight championship, led by the late Kobe Bryant. The Lakers play the Miami Heat. Game one is on Wednesday. Thousands of businesses are making adjustments because of the coronavirus. Sofia Gutierrez spoke with a family who resorted to relying on cacti and horses in order to keep their farm afloat. The Hernandez family business continues to thrive in spite of today's business climate. They rely on cactuses and horses. People need a place for their horses to stay. They wouldn't have them here to begin with and they also need someone to train them constantly. The Hernandez family business started two years ago. The yard was filled with cactuses from the previous homeowners. After trimming some cactuses down, horse stalls were built. People began bringing their horses for training and cactus buyers started coming as well. I started without knowing I had a business here. I was thinking about throwing the cactus out, but now instead of throwing them, I want to grow them. Training horses and selling cactuses is a side hustle for the family. Hernandez works in landscaping and his son recently graduated college. His degree in business administration and marketing allows him to carry that knowledge into his family's business. I saw like the opportunity and I said, okay, like, thank, like I'm grateful that I'm studying this just because now I can implement it into the home business that we have here. Many jobs considered non-essential have been jeopardized due to COVID-19. However, this family-owned business continues to keep business flowing. Reporting from Silmar, California, I'm Sofia Gutierrez. NASA's next launch will include a $23 million space toilet. The private cargo spacecraft Cygnus is set to launch from Virginia tomorrow. It will be taking a brand new space toilet called the Universal Waste Management System, scientific experiments, and skin care from Estee Lauder to the International Space Station. Cygnus NG-14's mission will also deliver 8,000 pounds of cargo. It's the craft's 13th mission to the International Space Station. That's all for us at Valley View News. I'm Ryan Ketchum. And I'm Amanda Alvarado. For stories any time of the day, go to our website, sundial.csun.edu. Thanks for watching.